Transport Policy Officer at East Riding of Yorkshire, uh, see their perspective on, on where we are with uh, taking action on climate change uh, and possibly even experiencing some of the worst <laughs> impacts of it. But yeah, Mark. Uh, yeah, Thank, thanks, Greg. Uh, first of all, welcome everyone. I hope you're all well and keeping well in, uh, in very uncertain times. Um, I haven't got any slides for you today. I took, took the view that if I started showing you pictures of the beautiful East Riding on a day like today, you'd all just jack it in and come over here. So we don't want to be generating any more carbon than we are. So you just have to take my word for it. The view outside my window is as near perfection as you can get. Um, if we, uh, I'm just here really just to pick up on a few of Greg's points and his key elements earlier on and, and try and signpost some, some issues from the perspective of a, a rural authority like ours. Um, it's a voice, sadly, that, that doesn't get heard a lot, because um, not all of us, um, um, for good reason and bad. Um, if we look at the ONS area classification that, that was shown earlier, we, we fit very firmly into the uh, countryside living bracket. Also, if you've had a look at Richard Lee tables, you'll see we're the wrong end of most of them, in that uh, we've got very low population density, and alongside that, we also have uh, just about the highest average CO2 uh, rate per capita in the north. Um, it, it's, a, it's a key issue for us, but it's, it is driven by the fact, leaving aside that we're generally, generally an affluent area, it's driven by the fact that there is a considerable distance often between where people live and where they're educated, employed, or, or indeed uh, access their services. Um, and there's not much we can do about that. Uh, yes, perhaps in the long term, spatial planning uh, might begin to resolve some of that, but it can't uh, immediately. So a lot of people are traveling a considerable distance, certainly much more than the five miles we'd accept as a, say, a maximum cycling distance. So that's an issue. We have an aged, an aging population, which again, um, can affect some of the active travel options. Uh, we have a poor and worsening public transport provision. Uh, unlike some authorities, uh, Oxfordshire and some, we haven't cut all of our supported routes, but we certainly had to cut quite a lot of them. Um, also in the public transport theme, as well as having fewer options, the only rail we've got is dirty rail. So we may be in a position, you know, come 2030 or, or soon after, where we'd probably be actually act actively encouraging people to use a clean private car over a dirty train. Um, obviously, that's worst case scenario, but it could, could easily happen. So there are a number of issues which we will find difficult to address, which are not necessarily helped by national appraisal, appraisal systems in the UK. For example, the web tag system would identify some of, certainly some of our active travel um, projects as, as poor value for money, although probably still not as poor as HS2 as it turns out. Um, but we just, so we're just not going to get the money for these kind of uh, big scale projects. We're also kind of uh, hit coming and going in that, for example, a new cycling facility standards LTN 120 uh, set standards for cycle routes, which are very welcome and absolutely appropriate to, to Manchester, to Leeds, to, to London. Uh, but for a route between a town and a, and a village, it serves of five miles that takes two dozen cyclists a day. Uh, but we won't be able to get money to build it anyway because we just couldn't, couldn't afford, given the cost-benefit ratio, to justify the, the kind of expense and scale that we're talking about. However, it's not all bad news for rural, rural areas. As I've already said, the fact is private cars are being cleaned up faster than, than much of public transport. Although a, a word of praise for our local main bus operator in East Riding, East Yorkshire Buses, although they're a small company, they've taken great strides to decarbonize their fleet. Um, so there is, if and when we, we emerge from this pandemic uh, and into a, um, a, a more positive public transport situation, I think there is room for optimism there as well. We also have a number of, of very active uh, community transport organizations in the East Riding. And again, they'll be easier to decarbonize than heavy rail. Um, there's also the much overlooked uh, sense of community spirit in some of these smaller settlements. This has really come to the fore during uh, the current pandemic. People are prepared to um, give someone a lift, a very informal lift share process, or just pick up some shopping for them and bring it back. So that as well will, will, does, has reduced uh, the, the distances traveled and reduced the carbon produced. I think, you know, a key issue for rural areas like ours is, is how we close those gaps. Um, one of the strap lines at the beginning of this is that decarbonization has to be for everyone and everywhere. Well, I think until 
we kind of accept that inevitably using current national appraisal techniques for most most of the money is going to have to go to the large urban areas and i get that and that is reasonable but at some point areas like ours who as, as greg just intimated have by and large taken the uh, uh, they've been on the front line of climate change with, with the huge floods that affected us in 2007, may have gone unnoticed out of our area, and indeed the, the storm surge in 2013. You know, we, we're at the edge of it, we're seeing it, um, you know, we're seeing sea level rise, you know, on, a, on an annual basis almost, in, in that uh, we're having to throw flood defences um, as fast as we can. Um, so it's, it's squaring that circle, it, it's how do, acknowledging that obviously a scheme uh, linking Leeds and Bradford will clearly serve many, many more people than, than a scheme linking Beverly and Hull. Um, but how, how do we um, break down those barriers to sensible funding that would allow us to, to start to make those shifts? I mean, dur during the, the last, the first tranche, sorry, of the Emergency Act to Travel Fund, we received £123,000. Now, for those of you in the business, you know, you know, I'd be able to do a lot with that and certainly um, not materially change modal choice. In fact, we spent it all on improving access, most of it on improving access to our biggest hospital and COVID treatment centre. Possibly we uh, already had an idea of, of what seems to be coming now this, this autumn. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, an, it's an issue for rural areas. We accept our position in that there are not as many people travelling those shorter distances that can be travelled by active means. Um, but at the same time, point Greg made, it has to happen everywhere for it to be an effective decarbonation of the, of the national picture. Um, fortunately, uh, I, it's not my responsibility to sort that out, nor will I be here to do it, uh, but it is a major challenge both for the North and for the UK government in order to do that. Just a last word on funding to conclude. Most of our new pedestrian and cycle schemes go in funded by the, our integrated transport block grant, which comes from the Department of Transport. Since 2010, somebody will have to remind me what happened in 2010, we've seen a 70% cut in that, in common with many other rural areas. So the EATF and the stuff that's coming now, tiny drop in the ocean compared to the loss of funding we've seen over the last decade uh, for, for pedestrian and cycle facilities. Um, again, how do we rebalance that? So um, I'm sorry, I'm not being able to give you any answers. I've just really thrown out questions. And certainly I've been extremely stats light um, which some of you may well thank me for. Um, thanks, Greg. I'm done.